Okay, uh, welcome to the sixth lecture. Uh, today we're going to continue the topic of specific uh, specification issues. So this is, um, you know, the second set of uh, specification issues that uh, we have uh, to discuss, and we're going to discuss issues like uh, misspecification and then functional forms. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, proxy variable uh, measurement errors, and then we're going to close off the discussion today with a discussion on missing data. Okay, uh, so before I go and discuss the material, I just want to remind you that you're going to have a midterm in about a couple of weeks or three weeks. Um, so I just want to make sure that you guys are all prepared. Uh, so the materials for the midterm examinations are materials from chapters discussed in meeting one uh, to meeting seven. And so it's going to be chapter one, two, three, four, and then chapter six and chapter nine. And I think we're gonna discuss chapter seven in the next meeting. So the exam will be posted in ELOC and students should also upload the exam in ELOC. So please manage your time wisely. Uh, if you cannot submit um, because of uh, you know, issues related to the timing, then uh, there's nothing else that uh, we can do. So make sure that you submit uh, within the time uh, and so that, um, you know, everyone is um, recorded. I will also randomize the examination format. So it could be multiple choice, it could be essay, it could be a combination of multiple choices and essay. So uh, just be prepared on the different types of uh, examination format. And um, yeah, hopefully this, uh, the materials are going to be uh, stuff that you learn in the, uh, in the course. Uh, and also please maintain your integrity during the examination. I just wanna highlight that I um, had to give out uh, an F grade for, for students uh, last semester who were working together for the midterm examination. Okay, so this is going to be a strict warning for everyone that you should conduct your exam independently, okay? and make sure that uh, you keep your integrity during the examination. Okay, it's better that you have a relatively okay grade uh, than you know, above average grade, but with uh, collaboration with your peers. Okay, so that's something that uh, we won't uh, tolerate. Any questions on the midterm uh, preparation? All clear? Okay, can, can I ask a question? Sir? Go ahead, I cannot hear your voice. Can you speak up? Um, uh, can we use uh, Stata for the midterm exam for regression and other things? I don't think you won't need Stata. Um, I don't think that you should also memorize uh, Stata commands. I don't think that's the goal of the examination. So I guess the goal of the examination is to really identify whether or not you understand the concept. So a lot of the questions will be conceptual questions and uh, thinking about creativity as well as, um, you know, depth of understanding of the materials. So I don't think that I'm gonna ask specific questions on uh, Stata um, commands, Stata syntaxes. I, I may ask you about interpretation of results from, you know, Stata output, but that's probably it. I'm not gonna do any, uh, kind of like regression. Uh, that's for you, I think, um, you know, for your project, but not for this exam. Okay, thank you, um, sir. Sure. Sir, I have a question. Um, uh, if, if, if some questions are, uh, can we like hand, hand write our answer or it's need to be fully typed on, on yes. Word? Uh, you can uh, either type your answers, uh, you can either uh, write down your answers and then you can also upload it. Uh, okay. in I think that's fine. Yeah. So which one you feel uh, comfortable and that's going to be uh, the format of the exam. I mean, the, the format of which you submit uh, the answers. Okay. But for multiple choices, uh, you will have to complete it online. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay. Um, other questions? Sure. Can I ask? Sure, go ahead. So the midterm, so the midterm exam will be a, a take-home exam or a real-time exam there? It's going to be a real-time exam. Yeah, so you're going to dedicate uh, two hours of your time uh, at the designated time. And then, um, you know, we're going to do the examination in ELOC. So I will try to 
uh, provide you with the instructions as early as possible. So you don't read it uh, the night before. Uh, but in general, my plan is to have you, um, you know, uh, do some part for X minutes and then the other part for uh, the remaining of the uh, exam. So please do uh, make sure that you read the instruction beforehand and uh, really make sure that you strategize for the exam. Okay, one last question or concern regarding the examination before I start uh, the materials today. All right. I'm sorry, sir. Sure. Oh. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I forgot you already said two hours. Thank you, sir. All right. Yes. Uh, two hours is, I think, an adequate time for everyone to answer uh, the questions. Okay. Good. All right. Um, again, please prepare for the examination. Uh, I think you've uh, worked hard enough uh, in terms of, you know, going through the lecture materials, um, attending the lectures. Um, working on the problem sets, as well as on the quizzes. So I don't want you guys to fail on just the midterm examination, given all your hard work. And please do not uh, fail because you cheated or you collaborate with other individuals in the class. I think that's going to be you know, a shame on your, all of your hard work that you put in uh, during this uh, semester for this course, okay? All right, so I'm just gonna uh, probably end the conversation regarding the midterm preparation. Uh, I'm going to provide you with a more detailed information on the steps for the midterm examination, uh, hopefully at least a couple of days before the examination. And so you have a clear picture on what to do during the uh, examination day. All right. So I'm going to continue on the issue of a specification. Um, so the issue of specification is quite important. So last week we discussed about beta coefficients. We discussed about interaction terms. Uh, we also had an opportunity to discuss about, um, you know, uh, specification in general. And so what we want to do today is trying to hone in on several specification issues regarding functional form specification and tests that you can actually carry out to identify whether or not there is functional form specification. Uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to also learn about omitted variable bias and proxy variables. Uh, so proxy variables that um, you know is available and can be used uh, to replace omitted variable and also using like values for um, proxy variables. We're also going to do a discussion on measurement errors um, and uh, last one we're going to do discussion on missing data. Okay, so I'm going to start with function form uh, misspecification. So the idea is that multiple linear regression model may not properly account for the relationship between the dependent and then the explanatory variables, okay? So in this case, we're facing an issue of functional form misspecification. So I'd like you guys to recall the following figure. So on the vertical axis, you have the uh, wage, which is logarithmic uh, log transform of wages. And then the, on the X side, you have years of potential experience, okay? The dots are the fitted values. So basically, uh, this is the fitted value from the regression. And then uh, if you can see the dash line, that's actually going to be the quadratic fit, okay? So that's going to be the estimated uh, quadratic relationship between the lock of wage and then years of potential experience. And so this is what, Graphical analysis before you do your regression um, is uh, really going to provide you an intuition on what kind of relationship should we expect from two variables of interest. In this particular case, uh, we're going to expect that there is a nonlinear and in particular quadratic relationship between the lock of wage and years of potential experience. Now, this is something that we may not be able uh, to gauge if we do not do graphical analysis. So I always encourage students to do a graphical analysis before doing any kind of regression. Of course, theory helps and then past or previous empirical studies help in the sense that it's going to provide you with an intuition on whether or not we should do a linear relationship or a quadratic relationship, but graphical analysis uh, never hurts, especially during the modern age of computing. Okay. So the figure suggests that there is a nonlinear relationship uh, and particularly a quadratic relationship between lock of wage and experience. 
However, suppose that we regress the following model. So we regress lock of wage with education as well as experience. Now, if the relationship is a quadratic relationship, however, we do not incorporate the quadratic relationship in the model. In fact, we only use re linear relationship, then we are committing a functional form misspecification, okay? So what will be the consequence of omitting the squared experience? Any thoughts, any comments? What do you think would happen if we omit the squared experience from the relationship? What would happen? Any thoughts? Uh, sir. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, maybe two things. I think the we would not be able to estimate the partial effect of experience on wage because there's no quadratic term. And second, there might be a difference in the direction of the only the linear term and the quadratic term. So if we include the quadratic term, then we would be able to know the optimal level of experience that uh, yields the highest level of wage, I think. So okay. that would not be captured. Yes, very good, Matthew. So I guess, uh, yes, that's the answer. And so uh, one, omitting the squared experience can result in a bias estimator of beta one because uh, squared experience can be correlated with education. So for example, uh, individuals who are more educated are more likely to have higher years of experience. And so dropping experience or squared experience in this particular case can lead to a bias estimator of beta one. It may not be much, but um, you know, if you can get an unbiased estimator of uh, beta one, uh, it's going to be really, really helpful in terms of identifying the return to education. Okay. Um, another important point that Matthew uh, also uh, stated is that omitting the squared experience can result in a bias estimator for the return to experience. Okay. And so in the original model, or at least in the presumably correct model, the estimated return to experience is going to be beta two plus two times uh, beta three. Um, experience. Okay, so this is going to be the return to experience um, in the original model where we incorporate squared of experience. However, since we do not incorporate square of experience into the model, then the estimated return to experience is just going to be depicted by the parameter beta two. So we're actually uh, you know, uh, estimating a model that would produce a bias estimate of beta two. So that's going to be the main issue um, on not including the square of experience into the model. Uh, we're going to obtain a bias estimate of the uh, beta two as well as potentially uh, beta one as well if the square of experience is correlated with education. Okay. So that's one very important note. I'm going to go to Stata. And in Stata, we're going to do a brief overview on a regression that uh, we did last week. Um, and we're going to uh, try to do it again just to provide you with a clear picture on what would happen if we do not incorporate the square of experience into the regression model. OK, so I'm going to switch uh, to Stata. In Stata, um, let's do. Let's see. I think this is a um, it's a data set that we used last week. So let me just pull them out. Okay. All right. So I'm going to use uh, the data set, set which one. Uh, this is a data set that we used in the uh, previous lecture. Um, if we do a graphical analysis using scatter plot as well as quadratic fit between log wage and experience, uh, we're going to be able uh, to obtain uh, the following uh, graphic, okay? So this is the graphic that we saw earlier. Um, we have y-axis um, is the log of wage, and then we have years of potential experience in the x um, axis. And we can see that that is actually a nonlinear relationship between lock of wage and years of potential experience. Okay. 
So I'm going to do a regression, okay? And in the first regression, I'm just gonna do, um, I'm just gonna do a lock of wage and an education as well as experience, okay? And then in the second regression, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do the uh, regression with the square of experience, and then let's see how they differ, okay? So this is the linear relationship uh, between lock of wage as well as experience. Can anyone tell what is the interpretation of the coefficient for education? You know, just in case, it's been a while since we discussed interpretation, so it would be nice if anyone can um, share what is the interpretation of this estimated coefficient, okay? Assuming, um, you know, all else constant. Anyone? Uh, can I try, sir? Yes, go ahead, Krishna. Uh, maybe it's uh, an additional years of education uh, equals with 0 0.05 uh, increase in the uh, 0, 0 0.05 percent increase in the lock wage and wage. Almost there. Uh, so just one uh, remaining uh, piece that uh, you left out, but uh, you're on the right direction. Just one more, probably. If I may, sir. Yes, go ahead. Just to add to Krishna's, it's uh, an increase of one year education will increase wage by 5.43%. Okay, thank you, David. So yes, uh, always recall that if you have a log lin model in the sense that you have a log transform variable on the left-hand side, and then you have a linear or level variable on the right-hand side, then the interpretation should be the estimated coefficient multiplied by 100%. So in this particular case, additional years of schooling is associated with higher year, higher wages by about 5.43%, okay? And also on the experience, um, anyone wants to do the interpretation? So maybe I will try. Yes, uh, go ahead, from uh, So I feel um, increase in one unit in one year uh, one unit in experience means that an increase in zero point zero zero five six two in wage percent or standard deviation. Maybe. Okay, so um, so we're not doing a regression with standardized variable oh, okay. here. Uh, so what we need to do is just multiply the estimated coefficient by a hundred percent. So okay. the uh, interpretation will be additional years of working experience is associated with higher wages by 0 0.562%, uh, okay? okay? So remember to multiply the estimated coefficient with 100% since we have a log transform variable on the left-hand side and you have a linear uh, or level variable on the right-hand side, okay, good. Okay. Um, so there are still other interesting variables here. And in particular, we have uh, what's called a dummy variable for a uh, female. We have a dummy variable for marital status. That's something that we're gonna discuss um, next meeting, okay? All right, so let's hold off uh, from there. And now the next regression that I'm going to do is that I'm going to incorporate the square of experience. So please make sure that you recall and remember uh, the estimated coefficients for years of education, as well as years of working experience, because that's something that uh, we're going to compare. Uh, okay, so in the next regression, when I incorporate squared of ex working experience, what you can observe is that the estimated coefficient for education is now lower than uh, the estimated coefficient of education in the previous regression. So this is uh, you know, in line with our expectation that individuals with higher years of education tend to also have higher years of working experience. And so if we, le if we leave out the square of experience, then we're going to overestimate uh, the current coefficient. So if we incorporate the square of experience into the model, then we could expect that the estimated coefficient will be lower, which in case it's the pack, okay? And then we can also see that the estimated um, coefficient for the experience variable is lower than before. So before was actually way higher than before. So before was 0 0.005 uh, or about 0.5% for every additional years of working experience. 
in this case, uh, we cannot directly interpret the estimated coefficient for the experience. Why? Because it's going to depend on the individual's years of experience. So the return to experience for someone who just worked, say, two years, is going to be different to the return to experience for someone who worked, say, uh, 15 years. Okay. Um, so if you recall the uh, you know discussions that we had last week, oops, um, we actually did a estimation using the margins syntax in Stata. And then uh, we also did a margins plot. So you can see that uh, for individuals uh, who work um, you know, in the early years, um, they're going to have positive return to experience until at some point, um, usually it's called after the peak of the effect of the working uh, age, and the effect of working another year is actually going to be uh, negative. Okay, so if you if you work beyond, uh, say usually it's about twenty five years, twenty six year, uh, then the effect of working additional year is going to be negative. But um, if you work before that, uh, the effect is going to be positive. Okay, so that's going to be um, kind of like the highlight of the discussion on why we do not want to do a misspecification on the model. You know, if the relationship is actually quadratic, then it's always good for us. It's always better for us to actually include the quadratic terms, okay? All right, any questions on this topic before I uh, move on to the uh, next topic? Okay, uh, cool. Okay, um, another example that um, you know I'm gonna discuss just briefly here. Uh, it's actually um, you know uh, something that you haven't uh, you haven't learned before, uh, but let's um, you know give it a try. So one of uh, one of uh, you know some some of the variables that we're going to use in the uh, regression model are going to be what's called binary variables, okay? So a binary variable is a variable with two responses. So it's either one or it's zero, okay? So for example, the variable female here is a binary variable, which is equal to one if the individual is a female and then zero otherwise, okay? We're gonna learn about binary variable in the next meeting, but uh, this is a very quick introduction of what a binary variable is. And so in this particular case, if we omit the interaction term, which is female and education, then we may be misspecifying uh, the functional form, okay? What's the reason on why we wanna incorporate the interaction between education as well as the female uh, variable? We wanna introduce the interaction term between years of education and an indicator for female because we suspect that the return to education is going to be different between male and female individuals. And if we think that the return to education is different between male and female individuals, then we should include the interaction term between female and um, education. The interaction term is going to provide you with information on or an estimation on how different is the return to education between male and female individuals in the data set. Okay, so that's the idea of introducing an interaction term between education and female, trying to identify whether there is a significant difference in the return to education between male and female. Okay. Okay. Um, another form of misspecification is that we use wage instead of lock of wage um, in many applications, um, at least in the area of economics of education or in the area of labor economics, we use a lock of wage instead of wage okay, in the regression model. Okay, um, and so that's going to be kind of like the assumption that uh, we use in the model. However, if um, the true model is one with lock of wage. However, in the model specification and in the regression, we just use wage, then 
we will not obtain an unbiased or a consistent estimators of the parameters, okay? So when you try to build your, or you wanna to try to design your uh, model specification before you do any kind of regression, uh, just make sure that you identify the theoretical uh, structure of the model. And in addition, it would be nice if you can also have a review of the, um, if you can also have a review on the past empirical studies, previous empirical studies, uh, they're gonna provide you with an intuition on whether or not we're gonna use level variable, just wage, or we're gonna use lock of wage or a lock transform variable, okay? Um, by you know sticking to the theoretical structure and by sticking to the past empirical um, you know evidence, uh, you're going to you know be more confident on the model specification that you use. Okay, so if you, as you've seen, um, you know in our previous experiences dealing with estimation, running the regression itself is now very very easy. Okay, so running uh, optimate, uh, obtaining the estimated coefficients in Stata is very very quick, less than a second. However more efforts should be put on the building of the model specification instead of just you know focusing on the regression because the regression itself is going to be relatively quick but the design of the model that's going to be the key okay any questions um in this topic before i move to the next one go ahead All right, good. So let me move uh, to the next one. And in this discussion, I'm going to discuss a particular test. It's called RESET. So RESET is a general test for functional form misspecification. Okay, so let's start uh, with the topic of RESET. So Ramsey back in 1969, it's been a while. Um, so um, half a century, I guess. So Ramsey, Ramsey uh, proposed the regression specification error test. So it's called uh, RESET. So the test is implemented to detect general functional form, um, the general form, uh, functional form misspecification, okay? Suppose that the true model is the following. So you have Y on the left-hand side and you have X1, X2, X3, X4 until XK, okay? If this is the true model, then no nonlinear functions of the independent variables should be significant when added to the model. Okay, so if the true model is linear, then um, you know if there is a nonlinear functions of the independent variables, the nonlinear uh, function should be insignificant when we add it into the model. Okay, so that's the idea of reset um, as a test for um, you know. A general functional form. Okay, so what does reset do? So reset adds polynomials in the OLS fitted values to the model to detect general kinds of functional form misspecification. So first we must determine how many functions of the fitted values to include in the expanded regression. So the practice is actually to include the square and the cube terms, okay? So suppose that y hat is the OLS fitted values, then the expanded equation is y, x1, x2, x3 until xk, which is the independent or the explanatory variables that we have in the true model. And then we're going to include the square of the fitted values and then the cube of the fitted values, okay? We're gonna run the regression, okay? And then after we run the regression, we're going to do a hypothesis test on the parameters uh, delta one as well as delta two, okay? So if delta one and delta two are actually significant, then we may be omitting some nonlinear relationship uh, between y and x, and that's an indication of misspecification, okay? However, if we fail to reject uh, that delta one um, and or delta two is actually zero, then uh, there is no um, evidence of functional form misspecification. Okay, so I just um, you know observe that there is a typo here. So instead of y hat to the power of two, it should be y hat to the power of three. Okay, so 
uh, please take a note on that. I'm gonna revise the slide deck um, right after this uh, meeting. Okay. All right. So I'm just gonna go into the next slide. Uh, again, why do we wanna incorporate uh, y hat square and then y hat cube. So basically, y hat square and y hat cube are just nonlinear uh, nonlinear functions of x j. Okay. So again, we're not interested in estimating delta one and delta two for the sake of you know interpreting delta one and delta two. We want to estimate delta one and delta two because we're interested in whether or not the original model actually miss important nonlinearities. Okay. So that's the idea of the uh, reset. So what's the null hypothesis? So the null hypothesis is that delta one equals to delta two is equal to zero. Okay. So the null hypothesis suggests that um, you know the cube uh, function as well as the quadratic function of the fitted values are not significant predictor of y. Okay. And so if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then there is no evidence uh, that we should add a nonlinear relationship between y and the axis. Okay. However, if the test turn out to be significant, then it means that there is a functional form problem. Okay. In the sense that we need to include uh, squared or maybe cube uh, terms into the regression model. Okay. Now, as you've seen from chapter four, when we did hypothesis testing for several variables simultaneously. In this case, we're not going to be able to use the t-test, but we can use the f-test because we are testing um, you know, uh, hypothesis for several parameters um, at the same time. OK, any questions regarding the uh, reset as a test for functional form uh, before I go into Stata and provide you with a very brief um, overview of reset? Okay, cool. All right, good. So um, let me uh, you know, go over the uh, reset uh, discussion very quick in Stata. So for this uh, particular discussion, I'm going to request you to open up uh, the house price one data. Okay, so the house price one data is gonna provide you with data on um, you know, lock price and then lock assessment of the house price. L, uh, the log of the lot size, as well as the log of the square feet, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're going to consider the double log model. So we transform the left-hand side variable uh, with a uh, logarithmic function, and we transform the right-hand side variables with a uh, log uh, transformation as well. Anyone recall what's the interpretation of the estimated coefficient if we have uh, the double log model or the log log model, anyone? It's the elasticity, sir. Yes, uh, very good, Matthew. So the estimated coefficients for the uh, log of lot size, the log of square feet are going to be elasticities, okay? So it's going to indicate uh, by how much the prices will change if the lot size you know, changes by uh, one percentage. It's also gonna provide you with uh, an idea on how much by, by how much percent uh, the price will change if uh, the square feet uh, the square foot of the uh, building changes by one percent okay so I'm just going to do uh, the double lock model um, okay my bad that is a typo there so it's um, lock L price and then L lot size and lock square feet um, as well as platforms okay so that's going to be the double lock model. So what we're going to do is we're going to identify whether or not we have not included nonlinear functions of the explanatory variables. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a reset by including the square of um, the predicted values as well as the cube of the predicted values. Now, before we do anything about that, what we're going to do is we're going to predict the value of the fitted values. Okay. So basically, we're going to ask data to generate a new variable, 
and I'm going to call the new variable as L price hat. Okay, so this is going to be the predicted values of the uh, regression outcomes. Now I'm going to uh, also generate a log price hat uh, two, which is log price hat uh, to the power of two, as well as uh, log price hat three, uh, log price hat to the power of three. Okay, and so recall that uh, when you want to do your uh, reset. You just have to include uh, the square of the fitted values as well as the cube for the fitted values. Okay. Okay. So we're going to run the regression and uh, we're going to identify whether or not simultaneously the coefficient for the log price hat as well as the, the square of the log price hat as well as the cube for log price hat is actually significant, okay? So if you recall, what we can do is we're going to use the test syntax in Stata. And so we're gonna test for the uh, coefficient for the L price hat two is equal um, to zero, as well as um, L price hat three, equal um, to zero, okay? Let me see if I left out anything. Um, yes, okay. So basically we wanna test whether or not simultaneously uh, the, the square of the log price hat as well as the cube of the log price hat are significant, okay? So if we reject the null hypothesis, then non-linearity matters, however, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then uh, nonlinearity doesn't really matter, okay? So you can observe that the p-value is 0 0.0831, okay? Is it significant, anyone? So if we have a p-value of 0 0.0831, is it uh, statistically significant? Uh, maybe it's significant under the 10% confidence interval, but insignificant under the 5% confidence uh, interval, sir. Okay, very good, Krishna. So it's not statistically significant at the 5% significance level, but it is statistically significant at the 10% significance level, okay? so. For this, I'm going to take this as a evident that uh, nonlinearity of the exploratory variable doesn't really matter, okay? Now we can do the same exercise, but instead of uh, using the uh, lock of price, uh, we're going to do it for the level variable, price, plot size, uh, square feet, as well as uh, the number of bedrooms, okay? So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to generate uh, the estimated uh, price hat, and then I'm going to generate price hat two, which is uh, the square price hat, as well as uh, price hat uh, three, price hat to the power of three, okay? So I'm going to do uh, the same uh, regression, uh, basically. And so uh, for this uh, regression, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a uh, rec on the log price and then lot size and then uh, lock of square feet, okay? And then bedrooms. And I'm going to include uh, the square of the price hat as well as the cube of the price hat, okay? I'm going to do and run the regression, okay? And then I'm going to do the same thing, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to test whether or not the parameters, the estimated coefficients for the squared price head as well as the cube price head are uh, significant uh, simultaneously, okay? Uh, what can you conclude uh, from the p-value of the app test? Is it statistically significant? Is it not statistically significant? Anyone? So if you have a p-value of 0 0.2701, uh, 
uh, what can you conclude? Um, can you reject the null hypothesis or you do not reject the null hypothesis? Anyone? Uh, perhaps uh, Mazaya? Do we reject the null hypothesis or we do not reject the null hypothesis in this case? Okay, uh, I'll try one more. Um, uh, Ambrosius Bill, uh, do we reject the null hypothesis here or we do not reject the null hypothesis given the p-value of the f-test? Uh, I think we reject the null hypothesis, sir. Okay, so recall that if a p-value uh, is larger than the significant level of 1%, 5%, and then 10%, then we actually do not reject the null hypothesis, okay? So if you do not reject the null hypothesis here, then uh, we can conclude that, um, you know, uh, we do not have to incorporate linearity or the level variable into the model, okay? And so, uh, you know, given this uh, exercise, what we can conclude is that we can actually use the nonlinear uh, variables, which are the log prices, excuse me, log of the square feet, as well as uh, the log of the lot size uh, into the regression model instead of using the level variables of lot size and then square feet um, in the model. Okay. All right. Any questions regarding, um, regarding this before I return back uh, to the slide to discuss the next um, topic. Okay, so let me just uh, provide you with a summary of reset. So reset is a test for um, functional form. And so the idea is that if um, there is a nonlinear functions or a nonlinear relationship between the y variable and the axis, then um, the square of the faded values and or the cube of the faded values should be statistically significant. Okay. So in our um, you know example in Stata, we do not reject uh, the null hypothesis if we incorporate the level variable into the nonlinear uh, relationship. However, it's the other way around. When we incorporate the fitted value of the uh, logarithmic functions into the linear model, um, the you know Stata suggests that uh, we do not re we, we reject the null hypothesis at least at the ten percent um, significance level. So it's a you know preliminary evidence that we should include nonlinear components into the regression model. So that's going to be uh, reset as a test for functional form. Now, it's actually very important for you to note that reset is not a test for unobserved omitted variables. I've seen in the past that students use the reset to test for unobserved omitted variables, and this is actually not a um, you know, it's not a good test for unobserved omitted variables. Another improper way of using reset is actually to test for heteroscedasticity. Okay, so we're going to learn about uh, the white test, which is a test for heteroscedasticity. Um, however, reset is not a test for heteroscedasticity. Okay, so if anyone is using reset, to test for unobserved omitted variables or using reset for a test of heteroscedasticity, then the use of such tests is actually misguided, okay? And so what's the use of reset? Well, the use of reset is just a general test for functional form, okay? Whether or not we should include a level variable or we can actually include nonlinear relationship into the model, okay? And basically, um, the idea is we're going to have the 
squared of the fitted values as well as the cube of the fitted values. And we're going to incorporate that into the expanded regression model. And then we're going to test the null hypothesis that um, the estimated coefficient for uh, the squared and the cube uh, fitted values uh, are simultaneously equal to zero or not. Okay, so that's the idea of reset and why we want to use reset in our um, regression exercises. Any questions? Okay, excellent. Um, so let's jump into the uh, the next test. So the next test is called test, uh, again, non-nested alternatives. Uh, so this is a test um, that we're going to learn and discuss as a test for uh, model specification as well. Okay. So suppose that you like to test whether an independent variable or a set of independent variables should appear in level or logarithmic form. Okay. So in this particular case, we want to regress either y on x1 and x2, or should we regress y on log x1 and uh, log x2? So as you can see, it's quite different with the previous setup. So in the previous setup, the models are actually nested. And in the case that the models are actually nested, you can use the f-test to test whether or not um, the variables are significant or not. So for example, if you think that uh, the square of experience is not important uh, or it's actually important, then we can do a t-test or you know, we can do an f-test on a set of variables as well. However, in this particular case, the first model is not nested into uh, the second model and the other way around. The second model is actually not nested for the first variable. Okay, and in this particular case, unfortunately, we cannot use an F-test. So what can we do? What we can do is construct a comprehensive model. So in this comprehensive model, I'm going to regress Y on X1, X2, the log of X1 and the log of X2, okay? So basically, this is a model that incorporates uh, both the level variables as well as the log transform variable. Now, we can test that the null hypothesis of gamma 3 and gamma 4 are simultaneously equal to 0. And the test is actually a test of the model with the linear variables. And so if we do not reject the null hypothesis that gamma 3 and gamma 4 are simultaneously equal to 0, then the model is of linear variables. However, we can also test that um, the null hypothesis is gamma 1 equal to gamma 2 is equal to 0. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then uh, the test suggests that it's actually not a model with nonlinear variables. Okay, so this is going to be um, you know the exercise uh, for the non-nested model, and we're going to use this to identify whether or not we should use level variable or um, you know nonlinear variables such as the log transform of x one and x two. Okay. Um, another one, which is a test proposed by Davidson and McKinnon back in 1981. So Davidson and McKinnon propose an alternative. Suppose that a regression of Y on X1 and X2 holds with the zero mean conditional assumption, okay? So the fitted values from Y which is a function of log of x1 as well as log of x2 should be insignificant in the former model, okay? And so basically what you wanna do is you want to do a regression of y on log x1 and then log x2, and then you get the predicted value of y or the fitted value of y, and then the fitted value of y should be included into the original um, regression, okay? 
Now, if the, uh, you know, if the true model is actually the linear model, then the y hat from the uh, nonlinear uh, relationship between y and x1 and x2 should be insignificant. Okay, so that's the idea of the deficit mechanism test, which is, um, you know, relatively more straightforward than the non nested test uh, discussed in the previous um, example. Okay, so these, uh, this is going to be the procedure uh, such that we want to test whether or not the true model is of the linear variables or the true model is of the nonlinear variables. In this case, is of uh, log transform x1 and x2. So what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, with the first regression, which is a regression of y on log x1 and log x2. Okay. And after we do the regression, what we're going to do is we're going to obtain uh, the fitted values, in this case, y tilde. Okay. And then we're going to use the y tilde as one of the explanatory variable in the regression, the linear regression. Okay. Now, again, we're not interested in interpreting theta one. We're only interested in whether or not we should use the log transform variable or we should not use the log transform variable. Okay. So we're going to test um, the significance of the theta one parameter uh, just to identify whether or not the model is of linear variables or the model should be of log transform variable or nonlinear variables. Okay. So basically, uh, we're going to test whether or not theta zero is equal to zero. So if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, uh, then it means that the model is of linear variables. However, if we reject the null hypothesis, so in fact, theta one is statistically significant, then um, you know uh, the model with log transform variable or the model with uh, nonlinear variable is actually a better um, variable for the model. Okay. All right. Any questions on the uh, Davidson and McKinnon test? Okay, good. Uh, if there is no question, I'm going to provide you with a very simple illustration of the um, Davidson McKinnon test. Okay, um, so recall, so I'm going to do uh, a new um, data set, which is the H price one, uh, the data set that uh, we used before. So, what we're going to do here, we're going to identify whether or not we should include uh, the linear variable or we should include the um, uh, we should include the uh, block transform variable on the right hand side okay so suppose that um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, so the initial regression is the following so I'm going to do um, regression of the log price and then lot size as well as log of square feet and then bedrooms. Okay, so this is the uh, initial regression that uh, we're going to do. And then I'm going to predict uh, this as the y hat. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to include uh, the regression of uh, the predicted value on the regression on the uh, linear variable. Okay. So what we're interested in is on the estimated coefficient of y hat. If the estimated coefficient of y hat is statistically significant, it means that we should actually use nonlinear variables into the regression model. However, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then we should use, um, then we should use the uh, linear variable for the uh, regression, okay? So after we do the regression, we can observe that 
indeed, the estimated coefficient for the y hat is statistically significant, okay? It's actually statistically significant at the 1% level, okay? What does it tell you? So the regression results suggest that it's actually better for us to use the log transform lot size as well as the log transform uh, square feet as the right hand side variable of the model. Okay. So that's going to be the advantage of this Davidson McKinnon test is to provide you whether or not you should use a linear variable or a non-linear variable as your right-hand side variable. Any questions? Okay, just to summarize, uh, again, um, we're going to use the non-nested model to test uh, whether or not we should use linear variables or non-linear variables um, on the right-hand side of the model specification, okay? Since this is not a nested model, we're going to have to use the non-nested approach. And so we're going to do um, two alternatives. The first alternative is to have the comprehensive equation where we have x1, x2, log x1, log x2, and then we're going to test uh, whether or not x1 and x2 are actually significant at the same time or uh, and the estimated um, parameters for log x1 and log x2 are significant at the same time or not, okay? Now, another alternative, the second alternative is to do Davidson and McKinnon tests. And so for the Davidson and McKinnon test, what we're going to do is, suppose we're trying to identify whether or not we should use nonlinear variable in this particular case, log transform variable. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're going to run the nonlinear relationship, okay? And then after that, we're going to predict the fitted values. And we're going to in include the fitted value on the linear uh, relationship, okay? And then if we do not reject the null hypothesis, then it's a evidence that we should actually uh, it's an evident, uh, evidence that we should actually um, use the linear model. However, if we do not, if we reject the null hypothesis, it's actually an evidence of uh, using model with non-linear variable. Okay, any questions? Uh, sir, can yes. I ask? Sure. Uh, honestly, I'm still trying heavily to digest this model that you just tried in this data. As uh, we can see that for the log lot size and the log square feet, from the point of view of p test, a p value, I'm sorry, uh, they are both insignificant at ten percent and five percent, and also for the based on confidence interval, uh, the log square feet is also not significant. But then uh, we can we can see the result for the variable y hat. So in this model. Is the variable y hat still stand, sir? Yes, again, uh, for the, this is a Davidson mckinnon approach. So in this particular approach, we're not really, uh, we don't really care about the estimated coefficient for the lot size, the square feet, as well as the bedrooms, okay? What we care about is only on the estimated coefficient for the fitted value or the predictive value. Okay, so if the fitted value or the predicted value is statistically significant, then it's actually a, an evidence that we should include uh, nonlinear variables, in this case, uh, the log of lot size, as well as the log of square feet into the regression model. However, if the y hat is not statistically significant, then it's actually an evidence that we, sh we should just use the linear variables, in this case, just the lot size, the square feet, uh, and then the bedrooms. So that's the idea of the Davidson McKinnon approach. Okay, so we do not really have to incorporate this, um, but uh, what we care about in this particular approach is just uh, whether or not the y hat coefficient is significant or not. Okay. 
Hope this help. Thank you, sir. I can see it clear. Okay. Any other inquiry before I go back to our slide and then discuss the next topic? All right, cool. And so what I'm gonna do here is just um, to kind of like summarize on the non-nested model, okay? So the issue with non-nested testing is that there is no clear winner. Both models could be rejected or neither model could be rejected, okay? And so there's an issue if uh, both models could be rejected then we don't know, um, you know, uh, we don't know who's, uh, which one is the better model. However, if neither model could be rejected, then what we can do is we can compare uh, the regression of the two models and then identify which one has the higher adjusted R square, okay? And the model with the highest adjusted R square is going to be the model that we choose, okay? What does it mean to have higher adjusted R square? It means that the, uh, there is more variation of the data that can be explained by the variation of the model, okay? And so basically the model is a better predictor of the, um, of the outcome variable or the left-hand side variable or the dependent variable if they have adjusted R square. Again, recall that adjusted R square doesn't have anything to do with causality. Adjusted R square, or R square in general provides you the information on how good your model at predicting the variation of the dependent variable, okay? And so, uh, you know, note that if the effects of the independent variables on Y are not very different, then either model can be used. Again, we can resort to adjusted R square to identify which one is a better model, okay? Lastly, non-nested tests are not suited when competing models have different dependent uh, variables, okay? So you should regress it with the same dependent variable. Either you wanna use price or you wanna use log price. And so do not change um, the dependent variable when you're using non-nested tests, um, you know, uh, as well as Davis and McKinnon tests in particular. Okay. Questions on the issue of non-nested testing? Okay, so it may seem that, you know, um, it may seem complicated, but it's actually not complicated in the sense that if you understand what does it mean by significant and then not significant and then um, the reason why we try to incorporate the weighted values into the regression model, then uh, you, you will be uh, able to understand, you know, the meaning of these exercises, okay? So make sure that you have foundation on, um, you know, inference, that's one. Uh, second, uh, you understand why we want to include some weighted values into the regression. If you have a good understanding on that, then yes, uh, you'll be able to actually uh, understand uh, the idea of um, testing for misspecification of the model. Okay, good. So that's on um, you know uh, issues regarding functional form misspecification and trying to identify which specification model should we choose for the regression model. The next part is trying to identify omitted variable bias and then the use of proxy variables, okay? So an omitted variable bias arises when a variable which determines why and is correlated with one of the included regressor, regressor is omitted from the regression. This is a, I think, a particular subtopic that we discuss in the uh, third meeting when we discuss the multiple linear regression model, okay? So if there is a variable, that is correlated with the outcome variable and it's correlated with the regressor or a set of regressors, then it's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to produce a bias. And the bias is usually called the omitted variable bias. Okay. So when such variable is observable, the solution is straightforward. 
which is to actually include the variable into the regression model. However, in many cases, you know, practically, these variables are actually unobservable. Okay. And so if it's unobservable, what can we do? Okay. Um, you know, uh, what's the approach uh, such that uh, we can get a better estimate in the sense that we get a, a non-biased estimate or a consistent estimate of the um, coefficient. And so in this particular exercise, I'm going to go back to the uh, wage data, okay? And in the wage data, we're going to identify ability and motivation, which basically cannot be observed in the data, okay? So if you go and look at the National Labor Force Survey, usually we cannot identify ability or motivation, okay? And so we have to think about how to actually come up with variables that could reflect their ability or variables that could reflect their um, motivation level. Uh, but then if the actual variable ability and motivation is available, then these variables are actually not necessary, okay? So that's the idea of uh, what's called proxy variable, okay? So we have talked about an important source of bias in OLS, which is omitted variables that are correlated with the included explanatory variables, okay? Basically, if we do not include that variable, we're going to violate the zero conditional mean assumption, okay? And so one way to eliminate or at least mitigate the bias in OLS due to omitted variable is to collect information on proxy variables, okay? So this proxy variable is a proxy for the omitted variable, okay? So if we think that the omitted variable is ability, then we should think about a proxy variable for ability. If we think that motivation is actually the omitted variable, then we should identify proxy variable for motivation. So that's going to be the idea, okay? All right, so let's start with the discussion on ability in the wage equation, okay? Suppose that by definition, ability is what affects log of wage. So um, suppose that the uh, true model is log wage of education, experience, and ability, okay? So ability included in the equation, uh, the MLR1, the assumptions, the first assumption, the second, three, third, and fourth actually hold, okay? OLS is unbiased for the beta j if we include all variables in the regression, okay? So assume that this is the true model, okay? And if we have education, experience, and ability, and then you start in the regression model, we're gonna get an unbiased estimate of the uh, beta, h, uh, beta j, okay? Now, the issue is that in practice, we cannot include the ability variable in the regression. Why? Because the ability variable is actually something that we do not observe, okay? Now, if we remove ability, which is correlated with log of wage, and ability is correlated with years of education, then the estimated coefficient beta one is going to be biased, okay? So we have to think about a way uh, to mitigate or to eliminate the issue of omitted variable bias, okay? Now in this case, we might have a measured variable, say it could be IQ score, it could be previous test score that uh, you take uh, earlier in your life, and the IQ score or the test score is going to serve as a proxy for the ability variable. So we don't observe ability, that's fine, but at least we have a proxy in the IQ test score. So that's going to be um, you know, uh, the discussion that uh, we're gonna have. So when we wanna use a proxy variable, at least we have to discuss uh, the assumptions for the proxy variable. So a maintain and not a very controversial assumption is that 
x3 is properly omitted from the original equation if we could include the unobserved variable, okay? So consequently, if we include the truth uh, variable into the model, then x3 can be properly omitted from the original equation, okay? Go back to the previous example. We have ability in the regression model. And if we have ability, then addition of IQ test score is actually not going to be beneficial in terms of explaining the why, conditional on having the ability, okay? So if you already have ability, there's no need for you to include the IQ score. So that's going to be the message of this assumption. However, if the unobserved variable and the proxy were actually correlated, the proxy should actually be included in the population regression function. One, it may not be a perfect proxy for uh, ability, but of course, it's actually a good predictor of uh, lock of wage. And so if that's the case, if the error and the proxy were correlated, we should include the proxy variable into the regression model in addition to the ability variable that we have, okay? So to sum up the first assumption, if we already have um, the variable that we need for the regression, then the addition of proxy variable is not gonna add much into explaining the uh, variable. In other words, there should be no correlation between the proxy variable and the unobserved, uh, variable, uh, unobserved characteristic. But if there is, a correlation between the error and the proxy uh, variable, we should actually include the proxy variable into the uh, regression specification. So that's the first assumption, okay? Uh, the second requirement is actually the one that is quite difficult to achieve. So in conditional expectation terms, the key equality is the following, okay? So, um, using other variables, x1, x2 is actually not gonna help to predict the omitted variable, okay? So the only variable that could explain the unobserved variable or the omitted variable is the proxy variable itself, okay? Again, this is something that it's at the uh, theoretical level. It's quite difficult to identify and test this assumption in particular. Why is it difficult to test this assumption in particular? Again, we do not observe X3 star, okay? Since we do not observe X3 star, then we, cannot, we can never test this assumption, okay? But we can always argue that um, the omitted variable or the unobserved variable can only be explained by the proxy variable. In other words, if we have the proxy variable, X1 and X2 do not predict the unobserved of the omitted variable. Any questions on the assumptions for the proxy variable? Okay, just to um, you know summarize the two assumptions. The first assumption, uh, the first assumption states that. So, okay, let me go back. So the first assumption tells you that um, if the omitted variable is actually observed and we can include in the regression model, then there's no need for the um, proxy variable. So that's the first one. The second one is that uh, the use of other variables other than the proxy variable is not gonna help predict the omitted variable. So that's the assumptions that we need. Okay, so in the wage equation example, suppose that IQ be the person's IQ score and then ability be their unobserved ability, then in the, um, you know, the regression using IQ score as a proxy variable, we would have to make two assumptions. The first assumption is that IQ does not need to be in the equation as long as ability is in it, okay? Again, this holds essentially by definition. The second assumption is that IQ is such a good proxy for ability that 
suppose we have ability and we can observe it, then the effect of education and experience conditional on having IQ in the regression model is going to be zero, okay? So again, suppose that we're able to identify ability into the model and conditional on having I3 as the explanatory variable, education and experience do not have predicted uh, capability for ability. So that's the second assumption, okay? So if we can argue, we cannot test it, but if we can argue that IQ score actually uh, fulfill these assumptions, then we can include IQ score into the regression model, okay? As a proxy variable, of course. Any questions uh, for this part? Okay, so let me go back uh, to Stata. Um, and uh, in Stata, I'm going to briefly discuss about uh, proxy variable. Um, and we're going to use the same exact uh, discussion on which equation uh, to discuss about uh, proxy variable, okay? All right, so what are the variables that we have? We have lock of wage, uh, we have um, education, we have experience, we have tenure. Uh, we have marital status, whether or not you live in the South, whether or not uh, you're a Black individual, and so on and so forth, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to regress. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, run the uh, codes that I have. So I'm going to uh, run the first model, okay? So I'm going to regress lock of wage on education, experience, tenure, um, indicator of marital status, uh, indicator of whether or not you live in the South, indicator whether or not you live in urban area, uh, indicator whether or not you're Black, okay? And so the regression tells you that the estimated coefficient is 0 0.065. And if you interpret this, it means that additional years of schooling is associated with a higher wage by 6.54%, okay? Now, suppose that I'm going to use IQ as a proxy variable for ability. And in the next regression, basically keeping all variables in the first regression and adding IQ uh, variable. What we need to identify is by how much the estimated coefficient on the education changes, okay? All right. So once we include IQ into the regression model, and the estimation provides you information that IQ is actually statistically significant, okay? What's more important is to uh, distinguish between the estimated coefficient for education without the IQ as a proxy variable, and then the estimated education coefficient with IQ as a proxy variable, okay? As you can guess, IQ is positively correlated with wages. IQ is positively correlated with years of education, okay? If you recall the discussion in chapter three, if an omitted variable is positively correlated with the outcome or the dependent variable, and it's positively correlated with the explanatory variable of interest, then the estimated explanatory variable of interest, the estimated coefficient for the explanatory variable of interest, in this case, education, is going to be overestimated, okay? Indeed, we can see that after we include the IQ variable as a proxy, the estimated coefficient is lower, okay? So instead of return to education of 6.5%, we have estimated return to education of 5.4%, okay? which is a significant um, you know, decrease of the estimated coefficient. So it's about one point, almost 1.1% 1 .1 difference in the return to education in regression with and without IQ as a proxy variable, okay? So it tells you that indeed, if you do not include ability in the regression model, the estimated coefficient on the return to education will be over estimated, okay? 
And we can also do, uh, you know, a third regression, okay? And in the third regression, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to identify whether or not um, the return to education is actually different for people with different, um, you know, uh, ability, okay? It's not really clear from here. Why? If you guys recall, in the discussion that we had last week, education can be assumed as a continuous variable. It's actually an ordinal variable, but let's assume that it's a continuous variable. We can also assume that IQ is a continuous variable. What would happen if you interact both or two continuous variables? What is the estimated or what is the interpretation of the estimated coefficient on education? If you remember, this is the return to education for individuals with zero IQ. Okay, remember this interpretation on the previous uh, lecture. And then the estimated coefficient on the IQ is the estimated uh, effect of IQ on earnings for individuals with zero education. Again, this is not something that we're interested in. Okay, well, what should we do? Uh, if we're interested in identifying the marginal effects of education for different IQ, what we can do is to do marginal effects analysis uh, as we did in the uh, previous examples, okay? So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize IQ, and then I'm going to identify the marginal effects of education for different values of IQ, okay? And so after... I do the marginal effect analysis of the effect of education for different IQ. What I'm going to do is I'm going uh, to generate the uh, average marginal effects, okay? So what can be seen uh, from this uh, regression, okay? So this is the zero line. If, uh, if it's within the zero line, it means that uh, the return to education for individuals with specific IQ is zero, okay? So suppose that I take uh, this point. So this is going to be the return uh, or the estimated return to education for someone with IQ about 90, okay? And in this uh, particular um, graph, which is this part, and this part. So the estimated return to education for someone with IQ score of 100 is 5%, okay? And an estimated, uh, we don't have individual there, but uh, suppose that we have individuals with an IQ score of 125, then uh, the estimated, uh, the estimated uh, return to education is quite close to 6%. So what does it mean? It means that there is a uh, increasing return to education with IQ. So individuals with higher IQ, they actually get higher return to education, okay? So part of it could be explained by the fact that they actually have higher years of schooling and the other could be explained by unobserved variable that we do not observe in the data set. Okay, any questions uh, for this discussion? Let me know. Okay, very well. So uh, this is the idea of proxy variable we have an omitted variable. And then if we omit that variable, we're going to produce a bias estimate of the coefficient. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to identify whether or not that is a proxy variable that you can use for the omitted variable, okay? Uh, so the assumption is that if uh, we have the original variable, the omitted variable uh, in the uh, data, then we do not need a proxy variable. And a proxy variable is such a good predictor of the ability uh, of the uh, omitted variable so that other variables do not have a predicted capability, okay? So those are the two assumptions. And the discussion that we just had shows you that IQ is actually a good uh, predictor 
of wage. And so we can argue that IQ is indeed a good predictor of ability. Because if you omit IQ as a proxy variable into the regression model, then the estimated return to education will be overestimated. Okay. All right. Any questions uh, before I um, go back and discuss another uh, strategy for using proxy variable? Go ahead. Okay, good, very well. So let's start with another way of, um, you know, making advantage or taking advantage of proxy variable, okay? So, so far we use proxy variables to control for unobserved factor. In other problem, the independent variables can be correlated with omitted uh, variable. However, we cannot find a control for the omitted variable. Now, in this case, we can include the value of the dependent variable at an earlier period, okay? So suppose that we have a regression for, uh, you know, the year of 2021. What we can do is we can use the lag dependent value, which is the value at 2020, for example, or the value of 2019, as the lack of dependent variable, okay? Why do we wanna include that? That's something that we're gonna discuss um, in this particular subtopic, okay? There's an interesting application of this concept, and this has to do with uh, the CD crime rates, okay? So basically the CD crime rates can be explained by unemployment and then per capita expenditure uh, on law enforcement, as well as uh, the lack crime, okay? So in this particular example, not only that we include variable in this particular period, which is the unemployment as well as the expenditure per capita on law enforcement, we also include the lack variable of the per capita crime, okay? So what does crime T minus one tells you? So crime T minus one indicates the crime rate measured in some early year, okay? So it could be th the previous year, it could be uh, two years prior, it could be three years prior, okay? Uh, so it doesn't have to be uh, the previous month, it doesn't have to be the previous year, but it could be, um, you know, some periods before. We don't want it to be too long. Uh, why? Uh, we don't want it to be too long because there could be some structural adjustment uh, between today and then, um, you know, be, between the, the year of the data set and the year uh, that we previous, uh, that we observed the lag dependent variable. And so that wouldn't be ideal, okay? But if we have it like close enough, uh, such that the data is available and can be used and can be measured, that should be used, okay? So of course, we're not interested, uh, that interested in uh, the estimation of beta three. What we're interested in is the estimation of beta one and beta two, but it could still be an interesting uh, um, thing to identify what would happen if we do a regression with and without the past crime rate, okay? So that's going to be uh, the like values that we're going to discuss, okay? All right, why do we wanna include uh, the past crime rate? So we wanna include the past crime rate to account for correlation between the unobserved factors and unemployment, of course, and spending on law enforcement as well. So by including crime T minus one in the equation, we actually do the following experiment. If two cities have the previous crime rate, so we control for the crime rate, that's why for the two cities with the previous crime rate and the same current unemployment rate, then beta two is going to measure the effect of another dollar of law enforcement on crime. Similarly, we can also do the following experiment. If two cities have the same previous crime rate and the same uh, expenditure for law enforcement on crime, then beta one is going to identify the effect of 
higher unemployment or lower unemployment on crime. Okay. And so this is why we want to use um, the lag crime rate as the as, uh, as one of the explanatory variables in the regression model. Okay. So let's go back uh, to Stata and I'm going to provide you with the uh, illustration of using um, lag uh, variable as um, as a uh, explanatory variable and then how would inclusion of like variable change the estimated coefficient of interest, okay? So we're going to use the data set um, crime two, okay? So the data set crime two provide you with, you know, lots of variable, but in this particular exercise, what I'm interested in is to include uh, the log of crime rate, unemployment, and then the log of law expenditure per capita, okay? And we're also interested in including the lag value of the log crime rate, okay? So what we're gonna do is the following. We're going to do a regression model without the lag of uh, crime rate. And then we're gonna do a second regression model where we include the lag of crime rate. Okay, and let's see what would happen uh, to, the, to the model, okay? So let's start with the first regression, okay? When we do the regression, without uh, the lack of crime rate, we can observe that unemployment and log of law expenditure per capita are actually not important predictor, okay? What's more concerning is the estimated coefficient. The higher the unemployment, the lower the crime rate. Does it make sense? Okay. Another thing that is not sensible is the estimated coefficient for the law expenditure per capita. The estimated coefficient here tells you that the higher the law expenditure per capita, the higher the crime rate, okay? So it's very counterintuitive, right? Uh, the good thing is that it's actually not statistically significant, but this tells you that it's quite, um, you know, uh, quite um, difficult to, uh, to you know, uh, identify and interpret the estimated coefficients for unemployment as well as for the uh, law ex uh, expenditure per capita. And so what we're going to do is in the second regression model, I'm going to include lack of crime rate, okay? So the lack of crime rate is actually statistically significant. So past values of crime rate actually predict the current crime rate, okay? What does it tell you? It tells you that there are some unobservable variable that affect crime rate that cannot be explained by an unemployment and, excuse me, there are, there, is, uh, there are unobserved characteristics that explain the crime rate and cannot be explained by unemployment as well as low expenditure per capita, okay? Now, if you identify the estimation, the estimated coefficient of unemployment is now positive, okay, which is, in line with the theory. And then the estimated coefficient for the law expenditure per capita is also negative, which is in line with what the theory expects. So the higher the unemployment, uh, we're more likely to get a crime rate. And then uh, the higher the law expenditure per capita, we're more likely to observe a lower crime rate. However, although the estimated coefficients are actually now in line, with what the theory and the prediction tells you, they're still statistically insignificant, okay? So in other words, we cannot reject the null hypothesis uh, that unemployment, and then uh, we cannot reject the null hypothesis that law of expenditure per capita does not affect um, crime rate, okay? So although they're not statistically significant, this exercise tells you the importance of adding pass values or lag values into the regression model to account for non, uh, for 
unobserv uh, unobservable characteristics um, in the data set that we may be omitting mm -hmm. in the data. Questions, go ahead. Oh, uh, sure, I have one question. Yes, uh, go ahead, Saki. Uh, so uh, from uh, from the book, it is mentioned that you can uh, use lagged dependent variables when uh, you don't know uh, the proper uh, proxy variables for uh, for your model. Uh, but if uh, there are some instances uh, where you can uh, use both proxy variables and uh, lag dependent variables, uh, uh, would that be possible, sir? Yes, it could be possible. Uh, in fact, if you have a proxy variable and uh, proxy variable is just one variable that probably, um, you know, represent a particular omitted or unobserved variable um, in the model. However, there could be many, many unobserved characteristics, many, many unobserved uh, variables that affect the dependent variable, the outcome variable of interest, but it's not observed in the data. Okay. And so by having both the proxy variable as well as the lag dependent variable, it could provide you with a solution of many unobservable variables that could lead to a biased estimate of the variable of interest. Okay. So that's something that you can always do. And uh, statistical tests uh, will provide you a guidance on whether or not IQ variable or um, IQ variable or uh, proxy variable or the lag value variables are actually very useful. Uh, maybe one more question, sir, for, uh, for me. Sure. Uh, so uh, because uh, this is uh, quite appropriate for uh, policy analysis, uh, do you think that uh, including uh, more than uh, more than one uh, variables from uh, previous uh, from from uh, historical data sets uh, maybe we can uh, we can pick like IFLS which is collected at uh, five waves and we uh, incorporate uh, all five waves into one model uh, would that be uh, a good method to analyze the impact of a policy come again what would you include uh the uh different data sets from uh from historical uh periods um such as uh FLS, which is collected uh during uh in five waves and uh you uh you want to uh, you want to see how uh how the uh unexplained uh effects from uh, uh, from the past period by incorporating all, all of those waves into one model. Would that be possible and appropriate, sir? Oh, I see. Um, so you want to include all five waves. So I don't think that will be necessary, although it's also going to depend on a case by case basis. So suppose you're on uh, 2014. I cannot remember whether that's the fifth wave or what. I think that's the fifth wave, okay? So if you're in 2014, you may be able to include um, the lag value from 2007, which is on the fourth wave. However, we should be very careful that seven year is long uh, you know, before uh, 2014. So in 2014, uh, you know, the government is different with 2007. Uh, there could be some structural differences um, between 2007 and 2014. Uh, so we should be very, very careful and, uh, you know, eventually using uh, the lag variable. Yes, we can use it, but just be careful when we do the interpretation, okay? I don't think it's necessary to include you know, uh, observation from wave three, wave two, and wave one. One individuals, uh, you know, um, may not be observed in the past. Uh, maybe they're just observed in the recent uh, waves. And then uh, even if we do, probably it could be captured uh, by the lag variable, um, say in the, uh, in the fourth wave. So it's not necessary to include all waves, but just the, uh, the previous wave, I think it's going to be uh, sufficient. But again, 
everything has to be reviewed case by case. Uh, maybe one more confirmation. Uh, yeah. I would like to know what do you mean by uh, structural changes between two uh, different uh, different uh, period of data sets? Sure. Uh, so it could be you know structural changes in the economy, the general direction of the economy. Uh, you know, if you can recall, uh, prior to 2014, we have average growth of six percent, but then afterwards we have an average growth of around five percent. Uh, so that could reflect the general structure of the economy. Uh, there could also be differences in the sets of economic uh, policies implemented by the government, uh, the types of uh, social assistance programs or uh, the types of uh, employment programs that are quite different between 2007 and 2014. And so those are basically unobserved characteristics, right? Unobserved uh, aggregate uh, policies that could affect behaviors of people in the um, general level. And so if you're trying to capture that into the lag value, but then the structure of 2007 and 2014 are quite different. And so we're not going to be really clear on what we're capturing from the lag value. That's going to be the issue, okay? And so, yes, it's ideal to include lag value, but if it's like long, um, you know, uh, in the past, uh, it could be uh, something that we need to be careful. It doesn't mean that we can't use it, but it means that we just have to be careful in uh, using it and interpreting uh, interpreting it. Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay. Um, so we can go back uh, to our uh, discussion uh, on the uh, PowerPoint slide. Okay. And we're going to do a discussion on measurement errors. So there are two types of measurement errors. There are measurement errors for the of the left hand side variable, which is the y variable, and then there are cases of errors of measurement for the right hand side variable, which are the x variables. Okay. So we're going to discuss both um, uh, measurement errors, and we're going to start first with the uh, left hand side variable. Okay. Now suppose that the true model is of y star and x. Okay. Uh, suppose that uh, you know the model fulfilled the um, usual assumptions, linearity and uh, parameter until uh, linearity of parameters until um, linearity of parameters until uh, zero conditional mean assumption. Okay, so in reality, measurement of y star is actually not perfect. So consider an income or expenditure survey. Okay. Suppose that you are now being interviewed, okay? And then you're being asked, what was your expenditure in the previous week, okay? How much did you spend on food, okay? How much did you spend on beverage? How much did you spend on electricity? How much did you spend on, uh, say, um, you know, phone credits and stuff like that? So. It could be that individuals are facing what's called a recall issue. So a recall issue is an issue where you don't really remember what you, uh, you spent on. And so basically you misreported uh, the income or the expenditure. So they're not, they're not misreporting for, you know, um, uh, just because they wanna do misreporting, it's just that, uh, they cannot remember on what they spent, okay? And so uh, in this particular uh, cases, we can observe what's called measurement error. So instead of observing the true expenditure, we're going to uh, ob obtain some report of the true expenditure, okay? And there is a difference between the true expenditure and what is being reported by the individual or the respondent, okay? And the difference is the measurement error of Y, okay? So uh, here we're going to assume that, you know, um, we're going to assume that the measurement error is actually random, okay? So it's not systematic, it's just something that is random. 
So what do we mean by random? It means that perhaps between the poor and the rich, there is no tendency for uh, the poor to have a recall issue, or there is no tendency for the rich to actually forget what they spent on, okay? Um, so if there is a difference between the poor and the rich, then we could be facing an issue of recall and measurement error as well. Okay, so that's the idea of measurement error. We do not observe the true value, which is the Y star, but we observe some uh, report of uh, Y star, which is in this case Y, okay? So this is what we actually observe, and this is what we're gonna use in the uh, regression. And so uh, we're going to do the regression using the actual y, uh, y that we observe in the data, but not the true y, okay? Now, owing to the assumptions, the assumptions that the measurement errors are not systematic, it's actually random, that the measurement errors does not bias the OLS estimator. So beta, one, beta zero and beta one are still unbiased. Again, this is based on an assumption that the measurement error are actually random, not systematic, okay? However, although the OLS estimators are not unbiased, uh, are unbiased, the variance of the estimators will be relatively larger, okay? And because the variance of the OLS uh, estimator is higher, then the OLS coefficient is going to be less efficient. Less efficient means that it has a higher variance or it has a higher standard errors, okay? So that's the issue of measurement error if uh, measurement error of the uh, Y variable, okay? So what can we do? Well, do nothing, um, again, uh, this is the data and we'll take the data as is. The other possibility, if it's possible, is actually to gather more data, okay? However, it's actually difficult to gather more data exposed. And so usually you gather the data given the design of the model, and then it's usually, there's a smaller chance for you to actually do data gathering after, um, after the fact or after the um, uh, analysis of the data. But if you have an opportunity to gather more data, please gather more data, okay? Why? Remember from the discussion on the second chapter and the third chapter, if you have higher or larger observations, then you're gonna have smaller variance and then smaller variance implied that you have a more precise estimate, okay? So that's going to be the idea. All right, any questions on measurement errors on why? Very good. So I'm going to go into the next discussion, which is the errors of measurements of X. And errors of measurement of X is actually more problematic than the errors of measurement of Y, particularly on the estimated coefficient. So we have to pay more attention on the possibility of errors of measurement of X when we're doing uh, you know, when we're building a model specification and eventually estimating the model. Let's start the discussion on the errors of measurement of X. Again, suppose that the true model is Y regress on X1 star. Again, in reality, we do not observe the uh, X1 star, but we observe some noisy measurement of X star. Okay, suppose we're interested in uh, the effect of uh, household expenditure on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side is the probability of stunting, for example, okay? Or students' uh, achievement or uh, students' um, academic performance on the left-hand side. However, we don't really see, uh, we cannot really observe the true expenditure but we have some noisy measurement of expenditure, okay? Now let's add more structure uh, to the uh, issue of error measurement. So there is an error of measurement, okay? Um, and then we're going to assume that there is no systematic 
uh, difference um, in the uh, systematic errors. It means that uh, the systematic error is random. Okay. It doesn't, so it's not higher for people who are richer or the other way around. It's not higher for individuals who are uh, actually uh, poorer. Okay. So the fact that we have measurement errors on X is actually random. Okay. It's a, again, some of these assumptions cannot be statistically verified, but at least we can provide a, an argument for these assumptions. Okay. What will be the consequence of us having error of measurement of X in the model? Okay. So what I'm going to ask you to do independently at home is try to do the simple manipulation in the uh, in the you know uh, independently, okay. So in this particular case, suppose that by manipulation x x x i star is going to be x i minus the uh, unobservable characteristic or the unobserved error e, okay. And then you impute that into the um, original equation, okay. So what would happen uh, to the uh, equation, okay? The first one is that we'll know for sure that the variance of the estimated coefficient is going to be larger, okay? So just as in the case of error of measurement of y, then we're going to get a less efficient OLS estimators in the, you know, uh, when we're facing uh, measurement errors of x. So that's one consequence. It's less efficient, okay? So it means that higher variance, lower precision. Okay, that's the first issue of errors of measurement of x. The second error, uh, and the second consequence, uh, the second consequence of errors of measurement of x is called the classical errors in variables or CED. Okay, so aside from having a higher variance, the estimated coefficient of beta one is biased. Okay. So by how much will it be biased? So it's going to be biased by this particular um, coefficient, okay? So if the factor is very close to zero, then the estimated coefficient will be quite close to zero, okay? However, if there is no error at all, then we can say that uh, the bias, if there is no error at all, then the factor will be one. And if the factor will be one, then there is basically no bias. So it, the, the size of the bias really depends on the size of the measurement error, okay? If the measurement error is really huge, then we're basically having an issue where the estimation of beta one is going to be very, very close to zero. Okay, and estimation that is biased towards zero is going to be referred to as the attenuation bias. Okay, so these are uh, the issues that we're going to face when we're doing uh, regression. These are something that we really can control as researchers and as users of the data, we'll take the data as is, okay? But just be mindful of the consequences of errors of measurement. If you have errors of measurements of y, then there could be issue of higher variance. Higher variance leads to lower precision of the OLS estimators, okay? However, if you have errors of measurement of x, not only that the variance is higher and so it's a lower precision, we can also face the issue of attenuation bias, okay? Where the estimated coefficient is actually relatively closer to zero. So when we're when we're when you're doing your um, analysis, when you're building your model, you need to be careful in identifying which of these variables that are prone to measurement errors. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's actually a good practice for you, uh, so that you can probably expect uh, the estimated coefficient. Okay. But if you ignore possibilities of errors of measurement, then uh, you may not be able to anticipate um, the issues of higher variance or um, you know, issues of attenuation bias in the data. 
okay? So just be mindful of these issues. Um, and if you have a variables that are prone to measurement error, uh, please take note and then uh, try to have a bit of explanation on uh, the consequences, okay? That will be, that will do a, you know, uh, uh, a lot of good things for the reader. Okay, any questions on measurement errors before we go and discuss missing data, which is actually a very common thing um, to have in data analysis? Very well. So let's start with uh, the discussion of missing data. So a lot of you will do analysis and then when you do your analysis in the future, you can actually face the fact that the data is missing. What should you do? Should you get rid of the observation or should you do something else? That's something that we're going to discuss, okay? So, you know, you and I will often find ourselves in uh, facing missing data, especially when you're dealing with micro data, okay? If you're using, say, uh, the National Labor Force Survey or you're using the National Socioeconomic Survey, uh, or if you're using, um, you know, the Indonesian Family Life Survey, IFLS, you may be facing issue of missing data, okay? So the data could be missing for either the dependent, the independent, or both the dependent and the independent variable, okay? Now, if the data is missing for both the dependent and independent variable, then you cannot use it in the regression analysis. Statistical software like Stata will simply ignore these units when running the estimation. However, what should we do if the dependent variable is actually available, but some of the independent variables are actually missing? Okay, what should we do? Suppose that we regress the following. We regress y on x1, x2, x3, x4, until xk, okay? With only observe dependent and independent variables, okay? So observations without the dependent or the independent variables will be dropped from the regression. In this particular case, the estimator is referred to as the complete case estimator, okay? In Stata, this is the default estimator. So if there are units that are missing data, Stata will automatically drop these observations, okay? So Stata by default is going to do what's called the complete case estimator, okay? Now, what is the statistical consequence of using the OLS estimator with missing data, okay? Well, it goes back to the idea on whether or not the data are missing completely at random. We call it the MCAR or the MCAR, okay? Suppose that the individuals die. It could be, it could be um, you know, issue of uh, missing completely at random. However, if, uh, the data is missing because the individual refuses to be interviewed for the survey and this individual is super super busy and you know um, systematically richer people tend to ignore the call for the survey or the call for the interview then we have an issue of uh, uh, issue of data missing because of something that is not random okay However, for the sake of our discussion today, uh, we're going to assume that the data are missing completely at random, okay? Uh, again, because if the data is not completely, uh, it's not missing completely at random, we're gonna have statistical problem, okay? So what should we do if we have data that we can assume is missing completely at random, okay? Suppose that we have a relatively, you know, a, a more parsimonious model where we have just X1 and X2, okay? Suppose that some observations are missing X1 and or X2. The common solution is a two-step procedure. First, create a missing data indicator 
for x1 and x2, okay? Say that it's m1 and m2. So m1 is a missing data indicator for x1, m2 is a missing data indicator for m2, okay? In Stata, you're going to generate mj equals to one if xj is missing and zero otherwise, okay? So m1 is going to be equal to one if the value of x1 is missing, zero otherwise, and then m2 is going to be equal to one if x2 is missing and zero otherwise. So that's a missing data indicator for the uh, regression of interest. So you should diligently check whether or not your data is facing an issue of uh, you know, missingness. And if it actually uh, do face the issue of missingness, then what, what, what you need to do is identify uh, which observations are missing and then create this missing data indicators for each variable that have missing values, okay? And then what you can do is subsequently create Z1 and Z2, okay? So Zj is equal to Xj if Xj is observed and then zero otherwise, okay? So Z1 is going to be X1 if X1 is observed and zero otherwise. Z2 is going to be equal to X2 if X2 is observed and zero otherwise. So when we do the regression, we're going to do the regression not on X1 and X2, but we're gonna do regression on Z1, Z2, which is equal to X1 and X2 when they're not missing and zero otherwise. And then we're gonna have the missing data indicators for X1 and X2. So this is going to be your regression specification. You need to include the missing data indicators for your regression. What would happen if you do not include the missing data indicators, okay? If you do not in include the missing data indicators, then your estimated coefficient for X1, X2, or in, that, in, in the previous example is Z1 and Z2 will be biased, okay? Another practice is that if you do not use the missing data indicator, do not use zeros for missing observations. Why? Because if you only change the missing values to zeros, but then do not include missing data indicators, then such practice will lead to bias OLS estimators. Something that you do not want for your um, you know, estimation result. Okay. Any questions on uh, missing data and what you should do in the face of missing data. Okay, uh, very well. So, um, you know, I think we can conclude uh, today's session. So we discuss about specification issues, with, which is a, con a, con a continuum of a discussion that we had last week on data scaling, data coefficients, um, as well as uh, interaction terms. Um, and today uh, we'll discuss more about uh, tests that we can do to identify functional form specification. Uh, we did a discussion on measurement errors as well as uh, missing data, okay? Next week, we're going to talk about dummy variables, okay? Uh, dummy variables is very important and it's actually ubiquitous in a lot of regression specifications and in a lot of regression models. So it's going to be very useful if, um, you know, to go through the discussion of dummy variables and how we can actually use it into the regression model. Okay, it's very, very useful and um, it's going to be very, very helpful in explaining several, uh, several cases. All right, any last thoughts or any last um, comments, remarks? Very well. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yes, David. So um, does that mean that when, for example, uh, I collect data and there, the data is incomplete, I should just leave the data as incomplete and just use these methods rather than filling it up with zeros and stuff? Yes. Uh, 
uh, first you have to create the missing data indicators. Uh, only after you create the missing data indicators, you can replace the missingness with zeros. Okay, but don't do it the other way around. Okay, don't fill it fill it up with zero first, uh, because uh, for some variables, zeros are actually meaning, meaningful values. Okay, so you cannot distinguish whether this is zero because of missingness or this is zero because you know zero is the actual response. Okay, so first create the missing uh, data indicator, and then um, after that uh, replace the missing values with zero. Okay, that's going to be fine. Okay. Uh, I do not recommend to drop the observations. Okay, uh, if you drop the observations, then you know, um, you know, lower number of observations mean higher variance. Higher variance mean lower precision and stuff like that. So it's actually preferable for you to uh, still keep the observations um, and then uh, apply or implement the practice that we just discussed. Very good. Uh, thank you other comments and questions. All right, um, so we'll, we end the uh, lecture early today uh, and I'm going to see you all for the dummy variable discussion next week. Uh, I hope that everyone uh, will have a good week and um, bye-bye, take care. Thank you, sir, have a great day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.